So suppose I wanted to build in redstone a 256 entry ROM. So we have a ROM. That's of course going to have an 8-bit address. 8 of course is going to give us 256 entries and then there's going to be uh, n bit outputs. <clears throat> Conceptually there's no getting around the fact that this is you know uh, basically a 256 uh, or an 8 to 256 decoder uh, plugging into a 256 to n encoder. Uh, there's just no getting around that. So if I wanted to build that in redstone uh, well I would have to create the uh, 8-bit bus for my inputs, I would have to create uh, my n-bit bus for my outputs, and then I'd have to build line 0 of the decoder, and then line 1 of the decoder, and then line 2 of the decoder, and I have to repeat that process all the way to line 256 of the decoder. Now, again, because a decoder is, you know, conceptually consistent, there's pretty much no getting around making all 256 connections like that. Uh, and that works in a, in a concept such as a schematic or, or a diagram or documentation, but it doesn't work too well in redstone. And the reason why is because this run right here has length. And when it comes to redstone wires, well, obviously the longer a wire is, the more repeaters we're going to have in it, the slower the circuit becomes, especially when you start accessing these addresses all the way back here. It takes a really long time for that address to make it, its way all the way to the back of the decoder, enable that very last line, and then have that signal make its way all the way back to the front. So one of the tricks that I've used to kind of overcome this is something that I like to call logic matrices, or matrices, matrices or matrix made of logic gates. Now, as far as I can tell, and maybe I'm mistaken about this, uh, there aren't too many textbooks that talk about this sort of thing in digital logic um, or digital logic circuits, and that's predominantly because a, a logical matrix or a logic matrix is basically just a decoder. If I created a 4x4 logic matrix, that's exactly the same as a 4 to 16 decoder, and, and I'll show you why. So here we have our classic 4x16 decoder. We should be fairly familiar with this. And, and here what we have is basically a 4x4 logic matrix. Now, both of these circuits are virtually identical. Uh, this one it looks a little bit more visually overwhelming and, and a little bit more complicated, but they work exactly the same. Uh, if I were to, uh, if you break this down, what you can see here is you can see a 4x4 matrix of AND gates. Uh, and so the idea being that, you know, an AND gate, both inputs have to be on in order for the output to be on. But you'll notice how the, how the inputs are all tied. You'll notice that each row of AND gates on one lead are all tied together, and they all go to this 2x4 decoder. Uh, likewise, every column of AND gates are all tied together, and they all go to this 2x4 decoder. Uh, and then, of course, those 2x4 decoders, their two inputs all come together to, to, uh, to create this bundle of four uh, inputs. And if you count the number of AND gates, there are 16. We have four inputs, we have 16 outputs. This is a 4x16 decoder. But how do we know that this behaves the same way? How do we know that only one of these AND gates is ever on? Well, looking at the nature of, let's just start with the one 2x4 decoder, we know that only one of these leads is ever going to be selected at any given time. Depending on the state of these two wires, either this lead will be selected, this lead, this lead, or this lead. Likewise, with this decoder, depending on the state of these two wires, only this lead, this lead, this lead, or this lead will ever be selected. And at the intersection of where both leads are selected, say, for example, we put in a binary 2 on this set of wires and a binary 1 on this set of wires, well, 2 is over here, uh, 1 is over here, so this lead is activated, this lead is activated, and so the only AND gate out of this entire array that's going to be activated is going to be this one right here. And so what we've effectively created, like I said, we've created a, um, and I forgot to erase those, sorry. Uh, we've effectively created a 4 to 16 decoder, but what, what we've done is we've arranged the 16 outputs of our decoder in a 4x4 four four grid. And so you can think of this uh, less like a decoder, really, and, and more like a, a grid that you can select particular points on. And so when you look at it like that, you can actually look at these decoders as less of 
decoders uh, or, or less of a, a, a contributing decoder to the 4x16 decoder and more like the X decoder and the Y decoder. So what kind of applications does this sort of thing have? You know, obviously uh, splitting this into a matrix where you have to select the X component and the Y component isn't exactly easier than just having a 4x16 array. Uh, well, as I mentioned before, uh, the physical length of a redstone circuit uh, does affect its, its speed. And so having a grid like this, if you uh, split your decoder or your ROM into a grid like this, uh, means that a lot of the um, buses are much closer together. A lot of the points of the decoder, or the, a lot of the points of the ROM, are much closer together. And so this actually can, if done right, improve the overall speed of your ROM. Uh, this sort of circuit also has other, other uses, of course, but uh, we'll start to see them being more thoroughly implemented in, in more state-based uh, circuits such as RAM and uh, later on in screens because screens obviously require uh, selecting pixels based off of an XY coordinate system. And so this circuit can actually uh, allow us to do that, but we'll cover that in a later video. But now that we've actually seen what this looks like in a, in a schematic, let's let's take a look at that in redstone. Let's see what that looks like here. So here I've actually created that uh, that 4x16 decoder or that 4x4 matrix, if you will, uh, in redstone. And here we have a, a, a 2 to 4 decoder here. We have a 2 to 4 decoder here. And this is basically decoding the x-axis. This is decoding the y. Together they create a 4 to 16 decoder, but I guess conceptually they're kind of different. Uh, make kind of yes, kind of no. Uh, but here you can see all 16 outputs of this decoder. And uh, you'll notice that you know if we had all 16 uh, outputs lined up on a decoder, this is actually just a little bit bigger. Uh, and I had to make it just a little bit bigger just to weave these wires correctly. Uh, but it's still smaller than all 16 inputs lined up like that. And the size benefit becomes more apparent with larger and larger decoder. So again, we're not seeing too terribly much with this 4 by 16, but if we had an 8 to 256 decoder and we arranged it in a uh, 16 by 16 grid, we would actually see a huge uh, improvement in space and of course speed. But just to show you how this all works, uh, again we have uh, we have our grid of wires here. Uh, one set of wires going over the top this way, as you can see and another set of wires going under the bottom this way. Uh, and at each intersection we have a piston and that piston is connected to two torches. And the idea here that the these are all going to be active low so they're only going to turn off when both these torches are off. Again creating an AND type situation. And those lines are also connected to their decoder so only one uh, of each set of lines is ever going to be activated at any given time. And uh, accessing points on this grid is a lot like accessing, well, points on a grid. Uh, so if I wanted to access, say, this point right here, uh, this decoder right here is going to have to go to the second column uh, because this starts at 0, 1, 2. Uh, and this decoder is going to have to access the first row because this is going to be row 0. This is row 1. So if I put a binary 2 in this decoder, uh, we can see we've accessed the correct column. If I put a 1 in this decoder, uh, we've accessed the correct row, and as a result we get the the exact point in the grid that we want. So benefit-wise, you don't actually see too much uh, benefit from this kind of circuit in a schematic or in documentation. Again, conceptually speaking, this is exactly identical to a 4 to 16 decoder. Uh, where you actually see the benefit is in the physical circuit. So again, you know, in this particular situation, with the knowledge base that we have right now of just pure combination logic circuits, uh, we can only use this sort of thing for either selecting, you know, one of 16 uh, combination circuits, enabling one of 16 combination circuits, or selecting one of 16 uh, entries in a ROM. Uh, but later on, as I said, we can actually use this for other applications. We can use this to select uh, RAM modules if we want. We can actually uh, eventually we're going to learn about RAM. Uh, we can take uh, chunks of RAM, we can arrange them in little modules and arrange those modules in a 4x4 grid and we can use something like this to select each module. 
uh, and then use uh, an address bus that spans throughout each module to select a specific address in those modules. Uh, likewise, if we create a screen, we can take this whole circuit, we can flip it on its side and turn it into a screen uh, pixel selecting circuit. Uh, all of those things are a little bit more advanced. They require knowledge of, of state, uh, which is something that we're going to cover in the next phase of the playlist. Uh, but the underlying concept, this selection of points on a grid, uh, is, a, is, is done using a circuit like this. So again, concept-wise, not too important. In terms of optimizing circuits, building physical circuits, this is actually a huge one. Of course, another small advantage that uh, is sort of a minor advantage to this is uh, the the actual decoders that you build on the ends here the uh, the axes decoders the x and y decoders uh, they're actually much smaller than the full-size decoder that you would have otherwise had to have made if you wanted to create say a 4 to 16 decoder uh, again the bigger the decoder the more benefits you see if i wanted to create a an 8 to 256 decoder uh, well that kind of decoder would be absolutely massive but we can do the same thing with a 4 to 16 decoder here and a 4 to 16 decoder here. Uh, the Both circuits would behave exactly the same. You would have 256 points, uh, all, all of which only one would ever be on at any given time, depending on the state of the inputs. Uh, but with, uh, with the 8 to 256 decoder, you have to build one decoder. Uh, with this sort of tactic, you get to build two much smaller decoders. In fact, in the in the 8 to 256 uh, decoder example, uh, your 16 to or I'm sorry, your your 4 to 16 decoder is actually going to be 16 times smaller than the total size of the decoder. So the two decoders together is is going to be eight times smaller than the 8 to 256 decoder. Now, whether or not you would consider this to be useful, whether or not you would consider this concept to be huge or not, uh, is entirely subjective, I suppose. I, I would say that the more that you get used to this sort of aspect of, of redstone, uh, the more use you will find out of a circuit like this. But for the time being, even if you don't think you'll ever use it, I would say just tuck it in the back of your mind, because later on down, down the line, uh, we will start to come across applications where we need a circuit like this. Uh, but for the time being, like I said, just know that if you have a linear decoder, as I'm going to call them, uh, where you have n to n squared uh, outputs, uh, you can usually break that up into a grid like this and uh, save yourself a little bit of space, uh, make your decoders just a little bit smaller, and make your circuits just a little bit closer.